basically through about three, four weeks, I put it on YouTube. Mm. That way you can download it and put it wherever you want to. You have access to it. Nice. I think we're live. It doesn't show me live, but um, I want to this is Joy, your host, kind of disorganized today. But um, I have a special guest with us, Gil Edwards, and he, we're about to tell his story. But before we do, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Luscious Moss Studio, which is owned and operated by Chad Quist in Ed Edgewood, Washington. Yeah, and he has a, a his his studio is set up mostly for drummers recording, and for guitarists. But uh, he 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 does other things as he's recorded my music. So uh, also he does have an environment there that creates collaboration and creativity. It's up to hope what he hopes for, and he, I think he gets it. So with that, I want to introduce our guest today. I I. Uh, I don't know if any of you know that his story, but he's fresh back from Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, I believe. And his name is Gil Edwards. I heard him play out at the Twin Dragon, and he just ripped the place up. He's a great player. So hello, uh, uh, Gil. And uh, what was uh, it to begin with? Well, how I ever got you into this? How did you begin begin your musical, your, 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 uh, Life as a musician. <laughs> okay. Hello, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> yada yada. I mean, yada, I, yada. Well, I to be honest. I think I think uh, I was listening to uh, I, I was listening to like surf music and things like that when I was a kid. You know, the Beach Boys and the Safaris and all these kind of surf songs. But not really. It didn't really wake me up. But I remember riding in the back seat of my uncle's Cadillac. We were in Los Angeles. And he was taking us to Disneyland and I'm sitting in the back seat and the Beatles came on the radio oh. and and uh, I was listening to this. And then my uncle started complaining about what terrible music it was and how horrible it was that this was commercial and people are buying this music. And I'm and I'm listening to him and then I'm listening to them and I'm thinking, yes, yes, <laughs> he hates it. Exactly. you know, and it just it all just went together. And I thought, wow, this is this is. This is cool. And then I just started b bothering my parents for a guitar. I never got a guitar. My dad didn't have a whole lot of money then and and not enough to spend on a guitar. So uh, he was a hunter and he gave me a dog, a hunting dog. And I had this dog for about six months. It was like my best friend. And then one day he came home and said he has a friend who has an old guitar that he'd like to trade yeah. for my dog. Oh, I, so I, 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 I traded. I traded. <laughs> what kind of guitar did you get for a dog? It was, it was an old, uh, about a 1930 Gibson F hole arch top, which is, I still have this guitar. Oh, my gosh. I have this guitar. Oh, my gosh. Now, at Beautiful. the time, were you living in Oregon? Are you, that's where you're from, I, I understand, yeah. originally. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was living in Oregon at the time. My father said I sounded so bad when I played. He wouldn't let me play in the house. He made me go out and play in the barn. Oh my gosh. So you were raised on a farm playing, learning to play the guitar in the barn. Well, you know, some barns are really nice around here. <laughs> Mine was nice enough. I had hay to sit on and horses that listen. Oh, horses that listen. That's yeah. lovely. What a picture. So going from there, um, how long was it before your father said you were good enough where you didn't have to be in the barn. You know, I don't think he ever really thought I was good enough to not be in the barn. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> he, no, he didn't like that kind of music, barely. No, you know, he's like my uncle, you know. Every time I play something like that, he goes, what is that? You know. Yeah. He actually told me he'd buy me a better guitar if I learned how to play um, Wildwood Flower. Oh, yeah. Is so that I learned how to play it, but I never got a better guitar, so I don't know. Oh, no. Oh no! It, wild with flower. That is the, that isn't the one about the uh, the the guys that were smoking pot, was it? No, this is before pot. Wildwood flower is an old uh, an okay. old bluegrass. Uh, okay. Da 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 da
when you guys put your comments in, please identify yourself. Uh, there's a little process you have to go through before it comes up on my board with your name. So I don't know who's talking here, but somebody says, hi, Gil. Don't know who you are, but hi, back, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other one yeah. said, I've I've heard of shredding, but barning um, is cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds um, like crazy, Ronnie, but I don't know. Anyway, so hopefully they'll tell us who they are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So after this, uh, how old do you think you were before you did your, um, or not old, but where in your life were you before you started playing live gigs? When did you start doing well, that? I got that guitar when I was 13. Uh -huh. And then I did, I started playing, I think, 14, 15 I, I got I got together with some guys and and then we were doing things like openings at Piggly Wiggly and playing for the <laughs> volunteer fire department in the park. That's pretty and, cool. Yeah. <laughs> they got you out of the barn anyway. <laughs> yeah, it got me out of the barn. You know. oh, oh dear. So when it, it, were you playing around Portland? Um before you came to Seattle or, or did you ever live in Seattle or how? No, I lived in Seattle. I, I, I moved up here. You see, Ronnie and I, we go back all the way to pre-high school. I, I grew up with her, you know, yeah. and, um, and she had, I'd gone down to LA a couple of times to play with her. And, uh -huh. and, uh, she called me one day when I was in Oregon and she said, um, what are you doing? And, and I said, I'm painting houses. I was working for a house painter. And she said, why? And I said, well, I, I, said I need money. You know? And she said, well, I tell you what, I'll be at your house tomorrow at eight o'clock. Have your stuff packed. You're going to come up to Seattle and play bass with me. Oh, and cool. I said, I said, well, okay. So the next morning at eight o'clock, she came by, I wrote a note from my boss and stuck it on the door. And then I took off to Seattle and then, and then I was just playing. We That's played amazing. all over the place. <laughs> so Ronnie knew you from school, did you say? Is that yeah, yeah. I've known her. I've known her since she was 10, 11 years old. Oh my gosh. What kind of what kind of girl was she when she was younger? She's a rebel. Ah still is. <laughs> yeah, just like today, she's a rebel. But she always the thing about Ronnie that I really love was it that she, she had a really strong heart and she always wanted to rock and roll. She always wanted to what? She wanted to rock and roll. I mean, <laughs> she wanted to play rock and roll and and she had a really strong heart and, and a really strong will. And that's why she's still doing it. Yeah. Yeah, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. Absolutely. So moving from there, um, there's a story about how you managed to go overseas. Um, and uh, we were talking about that earlier before we were live. So I'd kind of like to dig into that one. It was really interesting. Well, Ronnie and I, as I just finished saying, we were playing a lot around Seattle area and such. And we met some guys from Norway who they were on a vacation three months. So they saw us play a couple of times and started hanging around. And, and then they left and went back to Norway. And one day, um, Ronnie and I, we shared a house up in uh, North Seattle and, uh, we each had our own telephone in our respective rooms and my telephone rings and this guy from Norway saying, uh, we want you to come to Norway and play bass in our band. And, and I said, wow, you know, I'll, I have to talk to Ronnie about it. I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on with the band. And so I, I hung up and I went to talk to Ronnie. We met in the hallway and Ronnie said, you'll never guess what just happened. Some guy <laughs> called me from Norway. So they offered her the same gig. So uh, we agreed that, okay, both of us, or none of us. So they took us both to on a one-way ticket to um, to Norway. Norway. No, oh, well, what part of Norway, by the way? Is this Stockholm or Olesen. It's in the Olesen. middle. It's in the west coast, in the middle of the okay. country. All right. It's <laughs> cold there, <laughs> if I remember well, correctly. They have a reasonably cold winter. Absolutely. Yeah. When does the winter start? In the fall. Yeah, yeah, a little yeah. earlier than that. I mean, they have a really short summer, so at the end of the summer, it starts to be cold. You know. Cold already. So all right, here you are in Norway, and and Ronnie is there with you. And yeah. did you ever do that gig ever? Did you actually? Yeah, we, we started rehearsing with this band, and uh, 
it was it was they were okay they were they were all right guys good musicians but the, but the music was not what we were what we do you know we had we were having to change too much about ourselves uh right. you know, music's an art form and right and so so ronnie knew right away this wasn't going to work but we had two one-way tickets and i was i said to her i said if we go back right now like one week after we get here and ask for a trip home they're not gonna <laughs> give it to us we're gonna get stuck here both of us oh, no. so we agreed that uh that ronnie's we told we we said well you know ronnie's uh ronnie's got to go home because she has son home and he's he's not feeling good and she's got to go home but i'll stay here with you guys and rehearse so when she comes back we'll be all ready to go so they got gave her a ticket and she left and then, uh, and then there I was, you know, oh. <laughs> I did a bunch of gigs with this band and, and, uh, then we got into a disagreement over money and we're on our way to a, to a gig in Oslo. And, uh, I just, he, the guy just was, didn't want to pay me what I wanted to be paid. And, uh, what we agreed upon, he wanted to change the agreement on the way to a gig. So, so I, I just quit and got off the bus with my guitar and a, and a backpack. <laughs> I don't have any money. I don't speak Norwegian and I don't know anybody, but I'm a hitchhiker. So I'm hitchhiking, oh my gosh. hitchhiking to Oslo, you know? What, what happened? <laughs> You're leaving me out there hitchhiking. I never know what happened after that. Well, well, well when, before I got to Oslo, the band had blamed me for the canceled gig. And, uh, and so I was blacklisted. I couldn't get a job playing anywhere. And uh, so I wound up living on the street in Oslo with no money. I remember chipping a, a soda bottle out of the ice to, to, to make, you know, to make enough money to buy some cheese and some, oh my God. it was crazy. But I met this guitar player who was from Olesen, but I didn't know him, but I met him and uh, he was playing in a big band. They had like 15 people, 16 people in the band. And they were, they were occupying a whole floor on an apartment building that was rented by the hotel where they were working and they had an extra bed. So I got the bed and uh, then they would, we would go, I would go to the cantina with them every day down to the commissary and eat. Cause I just blended in with all the other hippies and nobody knew who was who. So I got to eat. So that was good, but I was still blacklisted. So I couldn't figure out how I was going to get money to get a trip home. Oh, Lord. And this, this uh, guitar player comes in one day with a newspaper saying Marius Müller is looking for a bass player. Marius Müller was a recording artist in Norway who was really on the way up. He was, mm. he was a rock star already, famous all over the place, and he was looking for a bassist. So he said, this is the job you need because this job will get you over the blacklist. This is, the blacklist is down here. Marius is up here. You get that job, you're okay. So mm. I decided I had to get that job. So I called him up and told him I was the only bass player in Norway and uh, everybody else was funky and slap plunk. And, and I was the guy who had to, you know, and he, he, he thought I was, he thought it was really impressive that I bragged so much about myself. So he wanted to meet me. So he got, together. <laughs> he took me, he took me to his birthday party the next night and introduced me as his new bass player. And I hadn't even auditioned yet. And I met at his birthday, I met every, every rock star, and pop music star in the business one night. Hey, this is my new play. This is my new bass. This is my new bass. So, so I figured if I had screwed up that audition, all the people I should have worked with, you know, that I could have worked with, all, th then they see me as, as the guy who lost the audition. It wasn't good enough for Morris. <laughs> so then I got a call from Morris, time to audition. So I, I show up at his, uh, at his studio, and there's a guy from the national press with a photographer. <laughs> So oh it's like, God. oh, not too much pressure. You got to <laughs> yeah. get the gig. So we go inside, and I'm I'm thinking, oh man, don't ask me to play anything too hard. I don't I don't know no, 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 no. what's going to happen now. Oh no! And he says, do you know Under My Thumb by the Rolling Stones? And I said, well, I've never played it before, but let's give it a try. So I have played it before. <laughs> <But I'm good. laughs> you gotta you gotta frost your cake. So I told him, 
I told him I'd never played it before, but I'll try. And so we started playing it and I played through it. And when it was done, they talked real fast in Norwegian. And then he said, you got the job. So we walked outside, <laughs> poof, poof, cameras, poof, 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 and I'm a rock star. Oh no, wonderful. Yeah. Boy, you must have a lucky star or something, I swear. Yeah, I earned it after three months on the street, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, you were telling me about that at, uh, earlier before we got on alive and and you were saying that um for three months you didn't have a place to live and and you're in a foreign country no money uh you didn't speak the language i mean my gosh and then it, all of a sudden out of nowhere comes this guy who offers you a room and gives you some good leads and now you're a rock star that is yeah. amazing yeah it was it was insane and 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 the, and the, the funny end to the whole story is that I played with that guy for about a year and a half. And then we're in the studio recording a new album. I just bought a new bass, really nice bass. So I had two basses. We're in the studio recording a new album. And uh, and the uh, immigration calls him because oh. I have a work permit. Oh, no. So who is this guy? Who, you know? And so we got called into the immigration and they deported me. They sent me out of the country. And I didn't have enough money for a plane ticket because we were in the in the studio, you know, yeah. when I'm not playing live, I'm not making money. So, right. so uh, I had to give him my new base for a plane ticket. So when I landed in Seattle, I, I was wearing the same clothes. I had the same guitar and the same bag and had the same amount of money in my pocket. So it was just like I time traveled back to a year. You, you were. Oh, yeah, no. Totally crazy. So you had all, all of that, uh, all that happened to you is, you know, it, how many people would love to have that experience? And then you get, and immigration gets you. Oh, oh yeah. no. So, so now you're back in Seattle. What happened? Well, you know, I just, then I just had to find a job, you know? So I went yeah. to work as a carpenter and, oh. and I uh, found a place to live. And I just wait, I just stuck around for two years because that was my quarantine. I couldn't go back for two years oh. because I'd overstayed my, were you in touch with the guy that that was the rock star while you were doing this no oh, this is when you were back here no you were not in touch with him no and then and then i went to uh i went to ronnie lee's management because i figured that you know maybe he can give me a gig so when i walked in the door he looked at me and he said ah the king of norway Apparently, it was my fault that Ron and Lieban broke up. Oh, no. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. Ronnie and I agreed upon it, but that's not the way he saw things. You know, in his eyes, Ronnie could do no wrong, and I was the guy who broke everything up, you know. Oh, my gosh. Was... <laughs> we, we, <laughs> so I, knew, I knew. I was blacklisted again, you know. I... <laughs> Boy, I mean, you got luck on the one hand and bad luck on the other. Good grief. Uh, we do have two people here that uh, somebody who didn't identify themselves said hi there. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, another one is hello, Joy and Gil from Andrea. She's uh, the gal that that um, is that is usually at the gigs with Lynn Sorensen. I uh, believe she was out there the night that you played at Twin Dragon. Uh-oh. I think you're, I think I lost you. <laughs> Gil, come back to me. Well, let's see what happened. Maybe we can get him back right in the middle of the story. I, I want to know the end. <laughs> Okay, I'm sending him a message here. Hopefully, we'll get him restored. No, he's not there. I think he's trying to come back in, but this is quite the story. I can't even imagine being homeless overseas with no money. It is um, amazing. Okay. So I'm not sure where he's at. 
but hopefully something happened there in the studio and we got cut off. Well, it's just me and you. <laughs> he's not he's not calling me or anything, so I just have to wait here. Anyway, um, we were we were talking with Gil Edwards today, and he was talking about his time in uh, Norway and how he ended up homeless there and without any money, without any place to stay. And uh, he was telling me that there was places that he could get some shelter every now and then. If somebody had left the door open in a building, he was able to stay under the staircase. And that's kind of an amazing story in itself to be homeless in a foreign country. So he's just in the process of logging back now. So and there he is. Hopefully we I my computer yeah. just my computer just died, so I went on my telephone. Oh no. <laughs> well, we got you back. Yeah, so, what were you saying about Lynn Sorensen? Oh, I was saying that um Andrea said hello to both of us. She's right. watching and and so she's she was with uh I believe the night that you played at Twin Dragon, she was there. I'm not okay. sure. But anyway, she's his friend and uh, she usually goes to the gigs with them, so I'm really happy to see her on here. Uh, so we lost you, but the people that were on here stayed with us. So now um, we have a comment. It's, this guy's name is Scott Roper, and he says, I met Gil in Germany in 2018 when he reunited with Ronnie and did a tour. It was fantastic, and Gil is quite the showman. Uh, thank you for interviewing him. Do yeah, you know? Scott's a good guy. Scott's oh, a good you know guy. Him. All right, great. Yeah. So we were in the middle of our story where you had managed to get back to the United States. And when you finally contacted um, Ronnie Lee's Manny Booker or manager, what was he? What yeah, was he was booking agent manager for Ronnie manager. in Seattle. Yeah. And he blamed you for this, uh, the, the troubles that you had in Norway, correct? So you have been blackballed more or less in, in by quitting that first band where you guys went to play. Yeah. And then you came back here and then you met a rock star and you were his, you were his bassist. So you had all this good stuff happen to you. <clears throat> and then immigration came after you. Lovely. And you ended up going back and contacting uh, Ronnie's manager. And uh, he was not happy with you, so you were blackballed again. So that's where we left this story. What happened? How did you redeem yourself? And where did you go from there? Well, I didn't redeem myself. I had to work for two years as a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. And I remember you said that, that the reason for that was that um, you couldn't go back to Norway. Norway for two. I mean, yeah, it was in Norway for two yeah, years. Yeah, I was, I was uh, like two years of quarantine, you know. So oh, I had to stay. So did you play during that time at all, or did you just work? No. As oh my gosh. No, no music. How are you feel? I, I mean, this is none of my business, but I mean, if that was me, I'd have been crushed. How did you survive that? Well, you know, I. Before that happened, I survived disco. So, you know, the way I figured, well, you know, when disco came out, like Saturday Night Fever came on the theater and every place that I used to play a gig, they tore down the stage, put up a disc jockey and a mirror ball and I was out of work, you know? So I, I look at it like one of those things that musicians had to survive, you know, I survived disco, so I can survive anything. <laughs> Yeah. I think that maybe it sounds a little bit like Ronnie might have been a bad luck charm there for a while. <laughs> We're talking about Ronnie Lee, by the way, if you just joined us. So now for two years, you're working as a carpenter and you're not playing any gigs. Um, you, were you living in the Seattle area or did you go back to Oregon? I was living in the Seattle area. Okay. I, was living, I was living in West Seattle. West Seattle. Yeah. That's some places there that are kind of natty. <laughs> I I don't know what they were like that you know when you lived there, but I'm kind of afraid of West Seattle. Yeah, you know this was this was in the 
early 80s or middle 80s. It wasn't so bad back then. It was actually really nice. I liked West Seattle. You know, it's uh, it, it saddens me to see what's happening in Seattle today. I mean, I'm not going to get into politics, but yeah. I love this city, you know. Yeah. I love the city. And whenever I come back here and I see what's going on, it's just like, oh, come on. Yeah. Sad. Yeah, it is. But that's life, huh? <laughs> that's that's life in the fast lane. Yeah, it is. So from from this point on, um, after your two year period was up, did you contact the people that you've been playing with? No, I um I kind of gave up the whole idea and just started looking for a way to make a living, you know. I mean Oh my gosh. But uh but I went back after two years I went back to Norway and it, the the rock star ship had sailed, but uh oh. but I had uh I couldn't find a gig, you know, because when I was when I was in this town and I'm telling everybody that I'm looking for a gig and they're laughing because, yo, you played with Marius. You shouldn't have any problem. I don't understand why you're talking to us. Mm -hmm. And and so I couldn't I couldn't get hired. So <laughs> I was a bass player, but I bought a cheap acoustic guitar and a little PA system and started going around playing alone in pups. Uh. And that worked out great. I was making good money and I played uh, every weekend. Sometimes I was playing four or five days in a week and I was uh, I was making good money. So I did that for about, I don't know, 15 years I did that. And then I, I, in the meantime, I recorded. Over. You went all over, though. I mean, you weren't just in Norway, if I understand correctly from your, your bio, that you also went to Denmark and Sweden as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I played in I played in. Uh, I, I released an album in Norway, the first album in 99. And that album was also released in Denmark. So I went to Denmark to tour a bit to support the album. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, I played in Sweden because I had a I had a sponsorship with Indian motorcycles. Oh, yeah. And they were based in Sweden. So I had a deal with them that I would play five or six gigs a year without getting paid for them. And they'd give me a motorcycle. Oh, that's so good I got a new Indian motorcycle every year. Oh my so, gosh! And I, I, um, I did that until COVID. Then no gigs, no motorcycle. But there was a lot of touring in Sweden because that's where they were based. So, during this time, um, you were overseas when COVID hit. Yeah, oh, when COVID hit, I was in Norway. Oh my gosh! What was it like there during that period of time? I think it was better than it was here. I mean, there there was still restrictions. Restrictions were necessary, but I got the impression that that uh, everything was so dramatic here. It wasn't so dramatic over there. Yeah. It was it was a sickness. You had to wear a mask, you know, and they were closing this and closing that. But it it, it wasn't. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm look. I'm just seeing what I see on the news and stuff. And, right. Exactly. And I look, like everybody's freaking. You're not going to make me wear a mask, you know. I, and I'm thinking to myself, well, why? <laughs> you know, why? Exactly. If, it's, if, it's, if there's a sickness, I think I want to wear a mask. I don't know why. <laughs> Do they have? Was that still during the time that they were giving out shots? I mean, were you able to get a shot there? Or, um, yeah, I had. I had both my shots, and uh, and then I went to Thailand. And I got a, I got my booster in Thailand. Oh my gosh! So how, what happened that that went that you went from uh, from what was it Norway to to Thailand? There's a story there. There's a story there. I did yeah, feel it. Well, I, I met a sweet. I met my sweetheart, and she's, ah. she. We went there together. Oh, okay. Did you play there when you got there? No, I didn't play there. It's uh, it's. Uh, I could, probably could have played there, but the problem was that they don't pay anything, you know. Yeah. They don't pay anything. and um, It's a fairly poor country. Yeah, and, then, you know, they got other things to use their money on besides entertainment. So <laughs> they do have places where people play, but but it's not lucrative. You know, it's not uh, so. But I, I, I toured in Germany, like he's talked about Scott when he sent the message. I've been about four or five times down in Germany on, on tour. And I also had my third album was released in Germany. It was recorded live on tour. 
And I have a German record company that released that one. So I've been down there a couple of times touring. And uh, yeah, it's just go with the flow, as they say. Well, you sure do. Yeah, a strong man. <laughs> so I've an awful lot, more than most, I think. So, I think I'm stronger than I am smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been accused of that a time or two. But <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so, um, I, I, where did, where in Germany did you say that you were playing? Where? In Germany, where did you play? Oh, I can't, I can't remember all the places I played. I played. Oh. In yeah, I, I went to Germany and I, I was there for three months and I love the country and hope it goes Volksmarching. I don't know if you ever heard of Volksmarching. But uh, they had walks, and you know, these scheduled walks that you'd walk and uh, for for various distances. And I got to see a lot of the countryside and meet a lot of the people. It was a fun time. I love Germany. I still love it. So, so yeah. now you <laughs> you're back. Um, you just recently came back from the songs, but I didn't really hear the part of the story where you came back to the United States. Well. I decided, uh, well, me and my and my sweetheart, we decided to come to America together. Ah. Um, so I got back here, and uh, first thing we did was we landed in Richmond, Virginia, because we knew somebody there that was that was offering employment. Hey. And uh, Richmond is not the place I'd like to live. Oh. <laughs> I don't know it's, much about Virginia. So. Oh, the place we were living in Richmond, uh, you know, the, it was all sirens and gunshots, you know. It was not a nice place. Really? So and this I was convinced her COVID. to come to the Northwest. But this was during COVID, too. So when you got to the United States, there was still COVID and restrictions? Not so much, but yeah. I mean, you're still having to wear masks and stuff, but they've started to open up. This is only, I, I've been back now about two months. Oh, okay. So yeah, uh, yeah. we're in a better place now. Yeah, so I came to the to the Northwest from there because I thought that it was really a shame for my, for my, my girl to see the worst part of America. If you yeah. first take her to America, at least show her something nice. <laughs> but I take her to the Pacific Northwest and we wind up in the middle of, of uh, Seattle taking a walk downtown and counting tents. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, I did it again, you know. <laughs> I did it again. Yeah, Seattle's changed a little. <clears throat> Not sure exactly when it started. Wow. I, had to, I had to go downtown uh, to the courthouse. I got I had jury duty. And it was not the same place. Although, you know, I never really, there were there were a lot of homeless people around the building, the court building, and um, they're in the little alcoves and whatever. But I've been homeless too. So I had a short time when I came from Minnesota to, to Washington where um, I, I had a few problems with getting a job and so forth. Without a job, you can't pay rent. And so uh, I didn't really feel, in, in, you know, scared. But there were no gunshots, no staffies. Yeah. And I haven't been well, back there since. So Well, as I told you, you know, earlier, I've been homeless too. And and but the difference I, I don't remember sitting in a box with six hundred kilos of waste paper laying all around me and bottles and cans all around it and and then living in the middle of a mess. I don't remember doing that when I was homeless, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure that's a necessary part of being homeless. I think there's a lot of people who actually have a problem, and that's why they're living on the street. But I think the people that you're seeing living in a litter box are not those people. Yeah. Yeah. I I had a um, few run-ins with that, but I was, I was homeless on Fort Lewis. <laughs> I was working there at the time, and they had 120 um, – little plots with picnic tables and a setup so I could go to the gym, take a shower at a commissary, eat at the commissary, sleep in my car in one of the picnic areas and, and our, you know, whatever. And, and I had a job on Fort, so I had a radio and I could call them a military police whenever I wanted to. It, it was in, getting colder and uh, I was in my car. So I, uh, I've been through that for a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> but, yeah. but, but like you, it isn't like what's happening around us. And I've talked to a few people. It was kind of a movement there for a while. And uh, yeah, it's a bad situation, but they are working on it. So that's a positive. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, the, the rents are so high, but hopefully that problem gets solved. So did she ever get to see the beauty of this country? Yeah, of the Northwest, your friend. Yeah, you? well, we've we've been down to down to uh, Auburn, Lake Taps, and oh yeah, <clears throat> down around the mountains down there, and it's beautiful. So it's very nice. So she I finally got to see the better the better part of our Northwest, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went to school in Auburn, so I I have a lot of contacts and friends down there. All right. So moving on from there, um, and now not how many years have passed here since you've been playing music from from the time that you left and went to Thailand and then came up here. How many how many years do you think you you didn't play for? How many years have I been playing? No, you did not play. You were kind of on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I the only time I haven't been playing is that two year period when I came back from Norway. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I heard you. I, I heard you two places now. I've heard you at the Twin Dragon and you um, you were something else. <laughs> and then I heard you, I believe, out at the Oxford. Isn't that correct? Were you out at the Oxford? Yeah. Yeah, I went to an open mic. Yeah. Yeah. I go there all the time. There's a lot of people here that do too. Um, yeah. So there obviously you have an amazing talent so i'm hoping that uh, you get into the into the system here yeah. what genre are you what 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 would you say you're shot rock and roll well yeah i mean it's my my kind of music my favorite music actually is music from the 60s uh, from the middle 60s to the middle 70s mm -hmm. um to me, that was the most creative time in pop music. That's when everything was created. From that time on, everything has just been copied and rehashed and done again with different sound. Basically, uh, you know, they don't write them like that anymore. You know, <laughs> it's like, so, um, so I, 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 that's what I really like. If, if I was going to do covers, I, I've written a lot of music. I have uh, three albums out and two and a half of them are all original songs. But, uh, I still enjoy playing covers because I like I like to see the audience's reaction. I like to see the look on people's face when they hear a song they haven't heard for a while. And uh and uh yeah, I enjoy that. You know. Okay. So I'm looking for somebody to cooperate with because I have no contacts, you know. I I'm I've been so I've been gone from here for 40 years. Yeah. So well, once you um start doing open mics and jams and I know you know, it's everybody here does it, and it's good to support other musicians. But as your contacts build with the level of your talent, I can't imagine that you not be doing this before long. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I, I would. Um, it's part of my plan to. St if I'm going to stay here, I need to play. You know, and if I can't find something to play within a reasonable amount of time, and then I'm going to back have to go back to Europe. Well, because I, there, I'm already, I'm all, I'm already hooked up. I have booking agents, and I have everything. I could just go to work. But I, I've been so, so far gone from home, and now I'm finally here, and I, I'm kind of hanging on my fingernails. I'd like to stay. Yeah. You know, well, let's so. hope that works for you. I, I, uh, it can be a challenge here, uh, no doubt. But once somebody hears you, if they don't pick you up, it'd be their loss. I'll tell you. I, I like your music. In in your bio, you were talking about <clears throat> the kind of music and your your um, philosophy on music and what it is that you like to bring to your audience when you do your own recordings. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the things that you were saying in your bio about how you like your your music to be honest, straightforward, and and creative? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think things today, and, and especially uh, pop music, and I mean, I've been listening to a lot, and also modern country music, everything is so produced. It's overproduced, you know, it's it's too shiny, and it's all starting to melt together. Pop and country, I mean, pop and country starts to sound the same, and, and I'm kind of like, 
it's all following a formula and like this and and I I I think that it's it's good to to look at music as an art form and not just as an economic you know no. I, I don't know it, I like to write a song that 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 my audience can experience something real something you know and and so many artists today that are on the that are on the the top of the pops or whatever these guys they won a contest or something you know they haven't got five years under their belt as a musician they're they're relatively inexperienced they get on the voice or idol or something and they win you know and and then 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 they get a whole bunch of makeup artists and sang teachers and music guys and stage help and then wow i'm a pop star <laughs> i kind of i kind of feel like it's just like anything else if, if you should be a you should be an apprentice and then you should get the job and then you should work your way up to be a journeyman and when you're a journeyman then you then you then you're a tradesman you can do your job you know and i i that's what i like i i don't like music made on computers and i don't like music it's made by producers. Yeah. I like music that's made by artists. Yeah, I hear you. I have a I have a really um, hard time with some of this because I don't when I list you know, I, I had a band for fifteen years and from two thousand to thousand fifteen and I played all all the older and the newer and some of the sixties and seventies rock in the band. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was down south where all the country music is. A lot of the places that you play down in the Tacoma area, there are there are a lot of there's a lot of country there. Hopefully it's still there. At least it was when I was out there in 2015. Um, and I I think Seattle's music has its own flavor. It has its own uh, I don't know how to say it, but its own soul. And there's a there's a gal here from um, Denmark, and she's a, a country star, independent artist, which is kind of where the business is right now, being an independent artist and not having a record company or whatever is backing. And uh, she goes to Nashville to record. And I was invited to go down there, but um, I listen to that music, and it's the same players that play with all the country stars. I mean, after a while, it's there's there's something missing, something that gets lost, and so I'm battling trying to find a place somewhere between the older country music and the and the newer. And I I like country rock, so I'm probably um, I probably one of those people you don't like because I I really do like country rock and I'm picking up more rock beats as I go, because I think um, what bothered me the most about the more traditional country was it was too slow for me. Yeah, have you have you listened to Lucinda Williams and no. uh, Iris Dement? No, I'll have oh. to write that down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's that's a, that's a really nice. Uh, middle place it's like steve earl is he's the one who showed me a bridge between country and rock with steve earl yes that is exactly what i'm looking for i'm looking for a bridge there and i you know i i'm uh i recorded it with a guy who i don't know if you ever heard of the band heart by heart and they do um they do the cover songs from the heart two of the players the bass player and the drummer from the original heart band and he does the lead for it his name is chad christ he's my sponsor here and yeah. excuse me he's a progressive yeah i would call him a progressive rock um it's kind of a difficult classification but you know you got to put it somewhere i guess and he plays country although he's not a you know that's not where he's, where what he actually plays out in the real world. So uh, I I will like his take on it. So when he does his lead licks and he puts some of the production stuff together, it's different. It's not like the Nashville song coming from Nashville. And of course I am a little bit stalled because I need to know where to go from here, and I'm still floundering. <laughs> You know, I, I just saw I just saw a documentary, or a, it was not a documentary really, but it was a concert video of Stephen Tyler. Yeah. Um, 
doing country music in uh, oh, really? the theater. Oh, and and uh, that demonstrates exactly what I'm talking about because he was totally accepted. And uh, the music he was playing, it was, it was rock music, but he was presenting it in a country way with, and he added a fiddle and a banjo and a couple of things in there. And it, I thought it was really quite good. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, Dolly Parton has just been asked to um, be nominated for the um, rock and roll. Um, what is that? I don't know what it is exactly, but uh, Hall of Fame, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And she's a country star. And, and uh, the judges just were, were there Sunday. They got in, in, inducted into that uh, Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they're country stars. So, yeah. you know, something is going on there. But, um, yeah, I did know about Stephen. Like, that's great. <laughs> I don't know that I think any of his songs were country, but uh, what, did well, he, what did he, he play that, that they... He played a couple of, of uh, Aerosmith songs on that thing yeah. with this band. Yeah. Uh, the band's called Loving Mary Band. Ah, is, is that uh, a country? Loving Mary is a country band of his? It's a country band, and Steven Tyler's fronting it. Gosh, I'm gonna yeah. have to look into that. That sounds really interesting. Absolutely, it's on Netflix, I think. Netflix. You know, when you came out to the Twin Dragon, um, Lynn Sorensen uh, it, it, it challenged me at that jam to learn one of his songs, and so I walk this way, and so I I spent some time redoing some of the words because I didn't like the tone of the song. But, you know, I just changed it a little bit more from a woman's perspective. And it's not, you know, it's the same song, same kind of words and everything, but slightly different. I, I don't like some of the stuff he said. But, uh, yeah, and so I've been working on that song. I had no idea about this country thing. I have to check that. That sounds amazing. Yeah, you have and to I, check it out. It's very nice. <laughs> very nice. So now in the, I, I've seen um, some of your recordings online and some of the ones that you have posted on your a website. Can you tell me um, again what your website, is it um, uh, gilledwards.com or how, how do we get to your website? gilledwards.com, G-I-L edwards.com, okay. one word. And, so I uh, have your music there. <laughs> yeah, and I'm on Spotify. All, all three albums on Spotify and uh, Apple Music uh -huh. and uh, uh, Pandora. Yeah. Did you go through CD Baby or somewhere else? Go through what? See, it's called CD Baby. They distribute your music. Um, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the record companies do this. I don't know. No, I don't get enough money from streaming to bother me about it. They, yeah, uh, nobody does. <laughs> Yeah. The record companies do it and I just say, okay, whatever, you know, because I don't know. I don't know. Well, so, CD Baby is where I, I put my music and it, it, it distributes to about 135 streaming um, systems throughout everywhere. I mean, it's digital, so it goes over to Europe too. And uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of Spotify. I like YouTube better, but um, I also like, <laughs> You know, I have my music on Amazon and I don't know how many others, but that's um, neither here nor there. But the question is, are you making music right now? Are you trying to record? Yeah, I was working a bit just before COVID hit. I was working on my fourth album and uh, I had an album title and I started making a, a song list and uh, writing songs. Yes. And then um, and then COVID hit and every all my gigs were canceled. Everything was stopped and I was starting it starting at number one i still think it's harder to get over disco but but uh it's uh it's okay i i just things are coming back now and so yes. i'm hoping i can meet a couple of clever guys here or make some kind of a cooperation and yes make some music you know absolutely well i hope you do too because i like what you do and i like that you know, I list some of the old, older songs that you brought back, like Mercury Blues. That's the first one that came to mind when I was thinking of your music. And 
I think one of your songs, is that the song where you did it two ways, two different ways? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I because love I, I learned the David Lindley version first, which is like da 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 you know, eight notes and really fast. Ah. And then and then I, I found a copy of Steve Miller band back when it was a Steve Miller's blues band, and they did that song and they did it that slower way. <laughs> and so I did I decided to do both versions in one song, like just kind of migrate out of one into the other, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I like the other version of it by Alan Jackson. Yeah, I, well, Alan Jackson's version is a lot like David Lindley's. It's maybe a little bit slower, but yeah. but it's similar similar arrangement. Yeah. yeah. So, whatever happened to these people? Um, this man that you you were doing the bass for over in in um, Norway. Whatever happened to him? You said he uh, was, he passed away. He passed away. He. He was a young man and he had a brain aneurysm and he was driving his car and and uh, he just just like turned off a light switch. Oh no. Yeah. Sad too, but he was an incredible talent. I mean, a great guitar player and a really nice person. I, I really liked him. But um we all have our time. Well, um that I kind of hit a hit a wall with recording because of the cost. I mean, it, for me, I I don't have the abilities to produce my own music, so I have to go to studio, and it gets rather pricey when I bring in people from the outside to work on the records. Like, I have to have a drummer. I have sometimes I need a you know a bass player or a steel or you know whatever. And then when you're paying all these people and a backup singer too, it can get rather pricey real fast around here. Yeah, well, that's the way I've always done it too. I've always had um, um, I've always had hired guns to do the instrumentation and vocal. I always I always had producers. You know, yeah. I'm hopeless behind a mixer board. I can't fix anything. <laughs> yeah. I I'll can play the guitar, that. play the bass, and I can sing, but I, I don't I don't understand what all those knobs are for, you know. Yeah, me either. <laughs> but I get the sound. I understand the sound. So is there any gig do you have any gigs lined up at all? Um have you been out looking for uh gigs? Not at all. No. I don't have one thing lined up. I I did I did have a one conversation with Lynn. Uh, uh, about getting together and talk about what we could do or, you know, how he might be able to help me make contact or or if we could do something together or whatever. Yeah. But we haven't been able to have a meeting yet. So oh, okay. I don't know what's going to go on there. But so far, that's pretty much the only, uh, that's yeah. the only thing that's been going on. I, I'm looking for, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of trying to figure out where I want to be here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there um Lynn Lynn produces music as well. He's got his own studio. Did you yeah. know that? Yeah. So and he, he goes a, a lot of different places throughout the area and he does a lot of jams like you went to at Twin Dragon. So I'm hoping something will pop up soon, but if I have any information or find anything, I'll let you know. Another thing is that when you went to Oxford, uh, Larry Walker, the guy who runs the sound system there, yeah. he does book gigs in, in the Oxford as well. He, he does book gigs at the Oxford. So uh, he, he usually gives gigs to people who come in and, and play there. And yeah. that, if you play there, you got a good chance of getting a gig. So, yeah, maybe I'll hit him up for a gig. <laughs> I would. I would. Maybe, uh, maybe I need to go to one more open mic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, we're coming up on our time here. Um, this is a portion of the interview where I like to ask, um, in, you know, listening to your story and all the things that happened to you since you were out in the barn jamming and playing that guitar and learning how to play it. Um, what advice would you give uh, anybody else who's coming into business? Now, you had an idea there about how long it should take before people, uh, you know, get out there and think they're stars or whatever. 
but the whole industry now is moving into independent artists where you produce your own music, you put it out to the different streaming um, systems and you go, you, you play at the fairs and wherever people can see you. And that, that tends to bring income without, without having to have a record company or whatever. So what are your thoughts on that? And and also what what kind of experience did you have that you would you would say that was my aha moment or my aha moments? In I had I had one. Uh, this is kind of off topic in a way, but I I, I played in Portugal. Um, I w I wasn't on the bill, and uh, I just borrowed. 30 minutes, 35 minutes from another band. I, I went there with him. He invited me and said, I'll give you 35 minutes of my set. I went on stage and there, and I, when I went backstage, there was no people. When I came up on the stage, there was 15,000 people. And I'm, <laughs> and I, blown away. and I didn't expect that. So I thought I was going to pee myself. And, but I realized that I was on camera and people could see my face as big as a house on both sides of the stage. So I couldn't be afraid. And, and I realized on that evening, cause I, I've got this, I did a couple of things where I got a lot of applause and I realized right then that's, that's, that's pretty much the drive. What, what drives me is, is you want to get as many people in one room to tell you they love you <laughs> at one time as you possibly can. Yeah, and, and that that to me is is very important. The people that you get a large group of people that accept what you do. Yes, and and also when it comes to giving advice to younger people, playing the guitar is easy. <laughs> uh, not for me, but yes, practicing <laughs> practicing is difficult. Yeah, so practice is everything. You have to keep playing. Yes. I had good advice from uh, from a, a, a very good guitar player. He told me that. You have to continue to play with the guitar like a toy. You have to play with it all the time. And that way you find things, you discover things, and you grow. Practice is everything. And also keep it keep it light like you're playing. Don't make it a job. That's that's the only advice I can give. In other words, enjoy it. Yeah, enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the audience will respond to you. Yes, I agree. Yeah. So, and uh, the last the last thing is do you have i know you're kind of thinking about all this but do you have an idea like a plan between from zero to five years from now where where you're setting your sights and what your direction you're hoping to go in it's funny man <laughs> you know next year i turn 70 so like what kind of a plan can a man have at that age it's like <laughs> I, I don't know, know. But we have a lot of older play, not older, but people that are in their fifties, uh, sixties, and seventies playing out there, and women too. So I know that you can go as long as you want. Yeah, I mean, my my thought here is that as long as I can stand up, <laughs> then I'm going to play. And and uh, I've kind of give up the rock rock star dream because at my age it's not so easy, but. <laughs> Yeah. But I still I still enjoy uh, the reaction of the audience and I still enjoy feeling like people like what I do. So as long as that's there, I will continue. Good. Good. I, I think I, I just loved your playing and I heard a lot of things within the music that that you were playing that um, it's not from around here. I, I think you picked up some of that European uh vibe i don't know exactly how to say it but i heard that in your music and i think it's very um it makes you stop and listen it truly does i hope so I, I hope that that will give me a little edge maybe you know because i hope maybe i don't know i hope but so you have to be seen so hopefully we, we can you can find those gigs and and let us hear more of you i know i'll go <laughs> so all right with that, I do. Uh, it's it's almost uh, t uh, three o'clock, and so I have to end this. I have enjoyed everything you've said, and and I appreciate the fact that you've really struggled to get through all this. And you know, uh, most of the people that I interview have had that dream of being this star or whatever, and there are a couple that are still hoping to be, get picked up like that. 
But I think you said it all, and many of the other people that have um, that I've recorded have said the same thing. It's what you that it's it's a soul. You're sharing your soul and the love with your audience of the music that you're playing, and you're getting that back from them. And that's that. Even though you're not going to get, most likely won't get rich unless you go on a show or whatever. I mean, I don't know what the formula is, but. Um, the most important thing is to enjoy what you're doing, to share it with the audience, to put that love out there, your soul out there, and to have it come back to you. Exactly. All right. With that, I'm going to close. I do thank you again for coming on, Gil. I hope we keep in touch. I, I definitely would like to see you in the future. No, it's been a pleasure, Joy. Thank All you. right. And I want you take care and um, you're quite the guy. You're a strong man. You, you, I just know you're going to do whatever it is you're planning on. All right. We'll try. We'll try. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for today. Um, Gil is quite the guy. And I think that he, he taught me a lesson today, which I probably already knew, but it was good to hear it again. And that is keep on, keep on. Never give up. As Jessica Lynn Whitty says, never surrender. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Have a good rest of your week. Next week, um, Lori, I believe it's Lori Hartman's going to come back to interview with us. So stay tuned. Bye.